or good afternoon, depending on where you're from or where you are. I'm seeing some nods. Thank you. This is one of those times where I wish we could all be together. Like, well, my living room, it would be a little cozy with 175 people, but let's picture ourselves like with tea or with coffee or with water, just looking and learning and getting into the Parsha together. And um, we're sharing in the chat right now where you're coming in from. And I'm going to invite you in this moment, if this is the first, I'm just going to remove the spotlight from me. Did it remove it from everyone? No, we're good. Okay, we're good. If this is the first moment that you've had to like switch positions in how you're sitting or you need water, like I said, or if you needed permission to text your coworkers, family, anyone that you're going to be offline for a little bit, this is me giving you permission if you needed it. So as Myra so lovingly said, I'm Arielle. I'm based in Brooklyn, where it is really nice out today. It's a little bit drizzly. And I run a community called Sela for people in recovery and those who love them. And one of my favorite parts of learning the Parsha, being in the Parsha, exploring it, is that I walk around the world with a lot going on all the time. You might feel this too, if you read the news or you watch TV or exist in the world. And sometimes it can feel like, is this just happening to us in this particular moment? Like, are we alone in this? And what the Parsha offers me is a deeply healing experience and seeing like, no, actually, we come from a long line of people who have been through things, who have gone through stuff and have wandered just like us. So we get to dig into the final book of Torah today into Devarim. Um, and we're going to look at some text. We're going to ask a lot of questions. If you're in a mood where you're like, I do not want to participate. I just want to listen. That's great. Or if you're a person has a lot to say, I want you to say things today. Okay. So Mara, can I, oh, we got a born and raised in Brooklyn and some Manhattan. And, oh, I have new friends in the chat. I'm so excited. Um, Mara, will you share the source sheet? Um, and friends, if you're not a person who learns through reading, you can ignore the source sheet and just listen. But I like to have some sort of receipts also. So just to catch us up, and I promise this will become interactive in a little bit, we got through, oh, thank you, Mara, you're the best. We got through a bunch of books of Torah. We got through Breshi, just to sum us up. If you were watching like a recap on Netflix or HBO, we got through creation of the world. We learned about our foreparents. We got to Shemot, slavery in Egypt, exodus from Egypt, receiving of Torah, building of tabernacle. Um, Vayikra, we learn a lot about the like the spiritual choreography or the rules and the commandments of how we do Jewish. Um, but Midbar, there's a lot of events that happen as through wandering through the desert. And finally, here we are at Devarim. We're nearing the end of his years of leadership and his life. Moshe Rabbeinu or Moses speaks to the Jewish people, preparing them for life. So essentially, it's a sacred history of our people's journey. It's a retelling of the things that were before so that they can make meaning and move forward. So I'm going to just introduce a couple of lines. Here's where we open right up to Devarim. We get this idea. We get the lines. These are the words that Moshe spoke to all of Israel on the other side of the Jordan. So if you want to close your eyes and envision, the people have been wandering. It's been a long journey. They get to the river and they can see the promised land on the other side. Moshe is giving them a pep talk, knowing he's not going to get to go with them. So we're on a, a, a precipice. There's a moment where things are about to change. Through the wilderness, in all of these places, in the 40th year of his leadership, third line, on the first day of the 11th month, Moshe speaks to the Israelites in accordance with the instructions that Hashem has given to him for them. He's a messenger, right? They defeated kings that had dwelt in their lands. And on the other side of the Jordan, Moshe undertook to put forth his teaching. So again, this is the moment. There's this emphasis on the words, the words that he spoke, this important speech before the people are going in. So that's where we're set up and what we're going to dig into. Mara, will you go to source two? Well, actually, you know what? Let's zoom back a little bit. I feel like this crowd I can get some feedback from. In this precipice moment, can I hear two people share? If you had to put yourself in Moshe's shoes or just watching this good TV show, how do you think he might have felt? Like, what are some of the feelings that came up? If you want to look at it as like Moshe Rabbeinu or this character who we're reading. 
we have in the chat, sadness. Any other feelings in this precipice moment? Okay, regret. Regret he can't enter. Okay, so anger. I love this liminal space. Whatever feeling that is. Yes, Andrew. I'm like liminal space. That's how it feels. Grief. I can suddenly speak clearly. Yeah. Responsibility to educate. Legacy. Oh, I'm loving this. So there could inner strength. Okay, I'll stop reading these, but I could read these all day. There could be a lot of feelings, right, that come up anytime there's a big moment of change, whether it's a life cycle moment. Um, a moment where we see ourselves differently. Maybe if there's some grief that comes up, some hopefulness, there's a looking back, a looking forward. Okay, we'll keep going. Happiness, yeah. So in the opening lines of this Parsha, we're zooming into this moment and I want us to really hold that feeling because I think this will be significant for us later. So in source two, we're gonna look at a Tosefta, which it's a, it's an, it's it literally means an addition or commentary that's added in, not included in the Mishnah. And this is one of my favorites, my friends. So can I invite someone, Mara, will you read it actually? It's focusing on this idea of the words he's sharing, the words he's sharing this moment. Go okay. for it. Since Beit Shammai declares some things unclean and Beit Hillel, those things clean. And since Beit Shammai, one permits here and Beit Hillel permits, how then can I learn Torah? We're going to zoom into this moment. We have these two schools of thought, right? Beit Shammai, Beit Hillel. They're looking at one thing and seeing it completely differently. Maybe some of us have experienced that with a loved one in our life recently. We look at the same thing, see it completely differently. How then? How can I learn Torah? What do I do with that? Go for it. Words, the words. These are the words. All of these words were given by a single shepherd. One God created all of them. One provider gave them the master of all creations. Blessed be God, said them. Words, we're looking at the word dvarim, dvarim. This keeps coming up. What do we learn from this? That all of these words that they're seeing, yes, two Jews, three opinions, all these words that they're seeing as differently were all created by one shepherd, one God, one giver. Thank you, God. So what do we do? There we go. So make yourself a heart of many rooms and bring into it the words of the house of Shammai and the words of the house of Hillel, the words of those who declare unclean and the words of those who declare clean. So I have to tell you, when I first learned this from my teacher, Erica Frankel, many years ago, I was convinced she was making up that this was from our tradition. And then it had to be just like a gorgeous poem, make for yourself a heart of many rooms, right? But it, it really is like from your heart, the, to the Hebrew says, what, what does it mean when we're given two opinions about the same thing or two visions about the same word? The text invites us to make ourselves a heart of many rooms and bring both opinions into it. Can I invite two people to share? What do you make of this idea of a heart of many rooms? How's it speaking to you today on August 9th in the month of Av? Two people. Yeah, I want to hear from Cheryl Aronson, I'm saying. Can we unmute? You can little do the little hand raise or your hand raise. Let's hear from Cheryl and then Kathy. Mary, okay? And if you make me co-host, I can help you do it. Hey, am I on? Yeah, Paul can kick us off and then we're going to go to Cheryl. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, how am I feeling on August 9th? You know, when I when I think back, of, you know, through our Torah study, you know, there were a lot of challenges, like you said. Uh, you know, it, it was not an easy, it was not an easy journey. Uh, and, and they're, they're right there. Now, okay. So when I look at it, you know, only a small portion of the Torah happens in the promised land. The rest of it's in diaspora. And it's all about getting back there. Uh, I think, so how, how that, how I feel today is that, you know, there are a lot of challenges in the world, but I think with all of us, with all of our hearts, we are all together. 
and we're going to see through this latest chapter of difficulty in our in our history, our journey. Um, you know, it, I, I really hold on to the covenant, right? I mean, this covenantal relationship that we have with God. Uh, you know, at times I, I just feel like you know it, it, there's so much despair. But when I but when we hang on to that, it keeps us going, and it's kept us going for thousands of years. And and I'm very confident, thousands of years from now, there will be our, you know, the people in the future will be talking the same the same way. That's how I see it. Oh, I love that. I love how you're elevating the like every day also to a space of the divine, actually, like this back and forth, the figuring it out. We're going to look back at it as a part of our story. And also it's about being in relationship with God. Um, I love God language. Also, I should have opened with this, whatever phrasing works for you. Good with me. I'm um, Cheryl. What do you think? Thank you. Um, I think that um, we our hearts have room for what they have room for. And we don't often, or I should say, we don't always naturally expand them, mm. welcome in what we can welcome in. We have to consciously build the extra rooms to, to um, welcome in the others. Right. And especially in, in, in situations like what we're, we're doing now, um, it's very hard to, to love the others. And in some cases, it's impossible. And that's okay. You know, every doesn't everybody doesn't have to love everybody because, you know, you can't always love your enemy. Sometimes it hurts too much. Yeah. Um, but the more you love, the more they'll love you. If you're lucky. Um, and the more room is you, you open to people, they'll hopefully open their rooms to you and you know, it won't be a big happy party for everybody, you know, teddy bears and, and unicorns, but um, hopefully the world will little by little mm. over time get Beautiful. better. But, you know, I've read this many times and I've thought, okay, that what I'd been envisioning the last 10 years of my learning this, like I have a heart and there are rooms and I'm going to open them you brought to me today, like I needed to hear it. Actually, like there's some construction that can happen. There's like, we might need to build some rooms. Your one bedroom studio apartment might actually be, needs to be a little bit bigger sometimes. I want to hear from two more people. Can I hear from Kathy and then Ellen? And then we'll, yeah. And there are going to be many opportunities. We are unmuting you. Hold on, hold on. It should work now. Yeah. Can't hear you. So we're going to come back to you. We will come back. I'm going to unmute Ellen. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking it's an, it's an aspiration because we're asked to make ourselves a heart of many mm. rooms so to construct it right <laughs> with good environmental practices or whatever you know what i mean and so we're not we're not asked to have a heart of many rooms but to make and i think that that is you know when i get down on myself for not being more of good heart it's something to remind me of mm -hmm. Um, and I think, you know, when we're talking about the real difficulty in the humanness of us, that there are some, you know, divine type beings or, you know, the Gandhis, the Mother Teresas, the, the Jewish prophets that, you know, whoever you named Jesus or whatever, you know, that, that we're given that these are the folks who 
were able to be completely of open heart. And I think for most of the rest of us, when somebody is literally, you know, trying to shoot us with something or have so much hate directed towards us, it's really hard mm -hmm. to be in that loving space. And um, and I wouldn't like um, I'm sorry I can't see the name of the last person who spoke. I wouldn't ask that of someone because I think that that denies sort of their humanity. So I think it's it's a it's a, a spectrum, a beautiful spectrum of things. Absolutely, that's really well said. Yeah, Kathy, we can get back on. Can you? Yes, we can. can you now? Yeah. Yes, go okay. for it. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, you know, it's pretty much what everybody's saying. I just want to reiterate, it is about perspective and allowing the space for everybody to have the opinion. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but it's allowing the space for everybody to express how they feel. And you can agree to disagree. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but you have to allow each person to have their opinion or their perspective and respect it, have respect for each other. And I think that's really what it comes down to is hearing each other and listening. Thank you. I'm glad we could get mm -hmm. you off mute. So folks, I want to stay you. forever. And I know we have, we're time is existent. So I'm going to ask the people who have their hands up, please put your answers in the chat and I'll try to get you on the next round. I do want to hear everything you're saying. I'm caught in the in-between. Um, so there's some beautiful points that have been brought up. I love this idea. If it's not just like have a heart of many rooms, be born with this, like, awesome ability to accommodate all kinds of important opinions that totally disagree with who you are or your opinions. Okay, fine. We don't just, maybe we're not born with that, but there's a making of it. There's a construction that has to happen. Um, and what I want to remind us about too, is like Hillel and Shammai in that last text are debating whether something is considered pure or impure, which might feel foreign to us today, but it's like, um, we want to think about things that have really high stakes. They disagree on things that have high stakes for themselves and for others. So I want to take us one a little bit deeper. There's a lot of ink spilled about this, like these words and like what's going on with this fifth book sort of being a look back with some creative license, right? Um, so Ramban, and again, I put a bunch of footnotes just in case you're a person who likes to look them up. I'm happy to share the source sheet also. Ramban walks us through the ideas that come up with these are the words which Moshe spoke unto all of Israel, which was our first line in Tvarim. And Mar I think I'm going to read this one and then we'll, we'll pop back and forth. The things in italics are my translation because I can't help but add myself in. So first Ramban accounts how Moshe gathers the people to declare God's commandments, right? So Ramban says, Moshe called all of Israel that were before him and said, hear Israel, the statutes, the ordinances, which I speak in your ears this day, which comes later in Devarim. And then he began the explanation of the Torah with the Ten Commandments so they could hear them from the explanation of the mouth of the one who received them, Moshe, from the mouth of the Holy One. Okay, we're set up. Then Ramban says, afterwards, he informed them of the unity of God. Like we learn in Shema, Hero Israel, the eternal our God, our eternal is one, and the commandments in this book. So Ramban reminds us, Moshe's first move, hear God's commandments. Second move, remember there's one God, everything's from God. This is why the verse is explained here, which Moshe spoke unto all of Israel. And it's stated later, Moshe called unto all of Israel because the explanation of the Torah, and this part's important to me, and the completion of the commandments must be in the presence of all of Israel, just as was giving of the Torah. So third point Ramban brings up, all of Israel's needed for this project. There's an emphasis on the word all. Kol keeps coming up. So what do we learn? Two things are suggested here. Mara, if you don't mind moving down. First, it stated that Moshe spoke unto the children of Israel according to all that God had commanded him for them. And this is an illusion or it can set. The word that is given by Ramban is remez. It's like uh, the hidden meaning that the commandments which he would tell them in this book are those that have not been mentioned thus far in the Torah. So the things they're going to get here, Ramban sort of opens up this little like 
passageway, hold on, there's a repetition of what was given, but some of it hasn't been stated yet. And second, it's stated that Moshe began explaining this law, meaning that uh, this is an allusion to the commandments which were already declared, that he would repeat them in order to clarify them further and give additional instruction about them. So sometimes if you Google a photo of Ramban or any of these commentators, you're like, what new thing does this guy have to say? Okay, this is pretty wild, right? What Ramban's offering us here is we get commandments from God. We're reminded there's one God. Everyone's going to be there. And what, why is the book of Dvarim needed? Because this thing happens where Moshe starts to explain, clarify, and give additional instruction. So Moshe saw fit to do so, although God had not even yet commanded him thereon. But afterwards, when he commanded him to write down the whole Torah, God said all these words were originally spoken by Moshe, and Moshe wrote them as he was commanded. So the final line here that I, I want to bring us into is, hence, there's no difference between the first four books of the Torah and this fifth book, as all are equally the word of God. So if you're a text person and love this, like you could be reading this and geeking out already, and I'll give my, my uh, take two. Ramban sees Dvarim as a type of sanctioned retelling of our story. The first four books are, here is what happened. We just got out, or not we just got out of, we got out of the book of Vayikra, which is here are the laws, here are the statutes. And in the fifth book, it is inherently sort of radical because it is Moshe's own retelling of what happened to them. If you're a person like I am who really likes narrative therapy or re the idea of reintegration, um, there's something that happens here where we have a fifth book of Torah dedicated to Moshe being able to retell this story. If we want to think about the initial question I asked, while he's in this moment of grief, meaning-making, inspiration, legacy, there's a really pivotal moment that I think happens here for him. And maybe why have this book at all is a question we want to ask ourselves. There's no new, new plot points, but the difference is it's told through Moshe's eyes. So I want to keep time. Ugh, I want to be here all day. I'm going to keep going. Mara, yes, yes, we're going to keep going. So fine. I'm very into this. If you're into it, put it in the chat. If you're like, girl, you're not getting it. You can also write that. I love a hot take. I love an opinion. I'll follow up with people after. So once I learned this Ramban, that like, okay, there's this radical retelling here. That's why we call him Moshe Rabbeinu. I love that. Um, one of my favorite Hasidic teachers, this Fatimet, teaches on a part of Dharam and says the following about this very idea. Mara, will you read it so it's not, I'm not one diva on the mic the whole time. Thank you. We love a diva, but I'll happily read. Uh, the book of Tabarim is the aspect of Torah Shmal Peh, the oral law. Through the Torah, Moshe's speech impediment was healed, and at the end of his life, his words became words of Torah, i.e. the book of Tvarim. Continue. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Torah Shval Peh is the power to create Torah through toiling in its study. Every Jew has this power, which was given to the Jewish people at Har Sinai. Thank you. So if you're me and you are, you learn a lot of Talmud and you sit in the, what's called the oral law, we have written law, five books, oral law, meaning Mishnah Gemara, the, what I like to think of as the rabbi is trying to figure out how you live out the written Torah in a life that doesn't make sense. Like much of what we live in today, like we're sort of living Talmud. So Sfatimat offers, this book actually brings up, it's the birth of oral law. It's the birth of Torah Shabbat Al-Peh. And that is healing. Actually, that process of learning how to make meaning of the experiences we've had in the moment that we're in. I mean, this bit says it heals a speech impediment because over and over it's Moshe spoke the words, he spoke the words, he spoke the words, he said them. This idea that we get to interpret Torah for our own lives is inspired by the very reading we have in this Parsha. Um, Mary, do I have time for an open question or keep going? I have time. We you don't have time. I have to keep going. Okay. I just want to hang out all day, but you can join me another time. So 
the, go back one second. So Torah Shabbat al Peh, right, is this power to create Torah through toiling in its study. Um, I looked back and I thought, what if we, we, this is not what we would do, but if Torah stopped before the fifth book, where does it end in the fourth? The fourth book ends with the daughters of Tzlofchad, a disenfranchised group of women, actually rewriting law and making law that existed before work for them in a more just world. So if our Torah ended there right before, the, the plot points will say ends with a, an actual retelling and a reinterpretation. Um, so if we look at Torah, fine, we get a written Torah, we're, we're uh, grateful for it, there's something that's uh, sanctioned. In the very end of the Torah, it actually sanctions its very undoing and its reinterpretation and it's looking back. So uh, just a question I wanna offer and we're not gonna get into it, but it's worth thinking about what are some things that you are currently toiling, understand? An event that has happened to you, something you've gone through, something you've loved, that when looking back, I mean, this is what we do in therapy or in recovery, we make meaning of it. And that making meaning of it, that process of Torah Shabbat al Peh in itself is a holy act. It is not radical and strange. It's from our tradition. So I want to close us here in a minute, actually. And I just want to go to the fifth text. Mara, thank you for being my uh, coach this whole time. Um. A school of thought that I, I love to learn from, and of course, not in the same category as uh, Torah, is there. there's 12-step format for Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. Um, and in the 11th step of this 12-step process that many of my community have gone through, you seek to create an ongoing connection with a higher power through means that make sense to you, whether it is prayer or meditation. So there's a series of steps of learning, of going through, making meaning of what you have, and then this 11th step is actually being an active connection with Hashem, the toiling in Torah. And that is actually how we grow into healing. So I want to offer us this, the, I, I would call it a bracha or a blessing. Um, I've changed the word Lord to Hashem because that's the words that my heart can hear. But I'm going to end us here. So it reads, Hashem, this is the blessing from the 11th step. It's not the 11th step itself. Hashem, make me a channel of your peace, that where there is hatred, and we can read it in my story, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I bring harmony, where error, I bring truth, doubt, I bring faith, where there is despair, I may bring hope, where there are shadows, I bring light, and sadness, I bring joy. And if you want to take a deep breath and really uh, accept this bracha today, Hashem, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. And ultimately, it is by being forgiven or by forgiving that one is forgiven. Um, we started this talking a lot about Beit Shammai, Beit, Beit Hillel. How do you build a heart of many rooms for opinions that um, don't jive with you? Sometimes we're actually able to do that with other people much more than ourselves. Um, and what recovery invites us into, if that's if that's a thing you can get down with, it's the idea of we might actually be able to reintegrate, re-understand our own stories and love ourselves a bit more deeply. And that self-love is a divine act. Um, so I find you in the month of Av before we get into Elul and Tishrei and it rolls into the high holidays. But what I want to offer you here is this month of Av, what type of reinterpretive work do you want to do? Do you need to do to divine act? And how will you do that? So um, thank you so much for being with me today. I want to hang out with all of you all the rest of today. Hopefully we can share this source sheet, um, Mara maybe. And yeah. um, I do this kind of work every Thursday evening in a Cheshbon and Nefesh soul accountability group. And you now are all part of the family and well, warmly welcomed, whether you're, whatever your life's journey may be. So I hope you have a wonderful day. If no one's told you, I love you a lot and yeah. I will see you next time. Thanks, Mara. Thank you, Ariel. We do have time for, for questions. Oh, um, cool. So if that works for you, um, we have folks in the chat who are, who are excited. Um, is it okay if we call on Earl? Anyone, yeah. Um, okay, uh, good morning. 
Good morning. Um, I'm a Unitarian minister who has a Jewish father and is rediscovering his Jewish roots. Um, the one thing that is driving me a little crazy uh, out here in Berkeley um, is that uh, I have a long history with the Pentagon, and I know we have to fight. Now that, and I know when we fight, people die. And that does not mean I support Netanyahu and everything he's doing or fail to acknowledge the terrible whatever. But when people, you know, say, oh, my God, people are being killed, it's sort of like that's what warfare is about. You kill the men, and sometimes you kill the children as well, and you take the women away, or sometimes you kill the women as well. And so uh, what I see on the internet that drives me absolutely crazy is the total historical ignorance of so many people who are posting. Thank you for taking my question. Thank you, Earl, and thank you for sharing. Um, I'm gonna take this from Ariel just cause uh, it, it's, uh, you're, you're bringing up big important questions and, um, Thank you for posing them. And uh, unfortunately, this is not necessarily the forum for answers to to how and where and. Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm not looking. I'm not looking for an answer right this minute. I just wanted to get the question out there and talk right. about the contrast between Berkeley and D.C. Yes, I think you you were uh, rightly connecting to the idea of of multiple truths and how do we discuss them in places like the Internet. Um, that is a big, a big question. <laughs> it's the work. Okay, friends, the floor is open either for questions or if you want to share integrative or interpretive work you want to do this month. Um, any, oh, there are, yes, there are questions from Andrea. Great. Um. When, when I, I first raised my hand when you talked about a heart for the a room for many hearts, I'm kind of glad you didn't did, didn't have time to to take my comment. But, you know, I, I was gonna I was gonna say that um, um, it, it's an admon admonition against arrogance. It's an admonition of, of imagining that you can really know which one is right and which one is wrong. And and you know, even God says, you know, zay vize are the words of of the living God, and um, but but then I, then I then when you went on, I I began to realize that that if you don't have a heart of 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 many rooms, if you don't have a, if you're not willing to make room for the ideas you don't agree with, you can't struggle with Torah. Mm. You will, you will always think that you you know how to interpret it, that you know the good guys from the bad guys, and and we have that. <laughs> this is it today. <laughs> um, um, we have that. In our Jewish in our Jewish community in here in North Carolina, especially with regard to Israel, you know, we, um, mm -hmm. uh, and some not so nice things have been done to people who disagree with the right wing um, uh, position, and um, and I think that that we'd be a whole lot better off if we had room for for divergent opinions. But yeah. we see it in the rest of our. But it's not so surprising because we see it in the rest of our society, you know. Um, calling people names and and um you know rather than looking at at the ideas that could be in your heart with uh with many rooms mm -hmm. oh that's so beautifully put and it's making me think right it's hard to do it without we'll call it outside people or other people and i find we often leave out the fact that like that means we have to do it within ourselves and that's also a whole other level of hard because what does that say if we can admit that certain things about ourselves we don't love yet I mean I think there's actually like a healing that comes from there you said like a an admission that we don't know everything either about ourselves or others there's a living in the not knowing the more we don't know is actually the more we know or vice versa so thank you for that or just point um I'm just Joel, I see you raising your hand and waving it. I'm trying to unmute you, but I don't know how yet. I hit ask to unmute, but I want to hear you. And this is Joel from Dallas, Texas. I get from what you said or these readings, these instructions is the Shema, the central prayer of Judaism. Hear, hear O Israel. 
the Lord is God, the Lord is one. This is what we say every time we come to services. That we believe in this higher power, this one God is central to our belief system. Shema Yisrael. Do you have a question? It's a beautiful point. Do you have a question? Yes, everybody should follow it. And this is what he's saying. <laughs> Do that's it. That's not a question. That's an exclamation. But I love the exclamation. No, this comes directly out of Deuteronomy. Right on. Thank you for that point. <laughs> um, I, Do we have another, any other questions or there's... I saw Shula's hand raised just yes. a minute ago, but then um, I believe I'm not seeing it any longer. Um, oh, here we go. Great. We'll go to Shula and then uh, Maybe we'll, iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> shalom, shalom. Um, thank you for a beautiful presentation. I, I kind of came in right around the part where um, Ariel, you were talking about um, it's going to take everyone. Um, you know, that, uh, and the interesting is about the, the word everyone includes the word one, mm. you know, um, so it, it's going to take everyone and being able to, you know, recognize, um, recognize that um, we've got borders, we've got boundaries, we've got safeguards, but um, we have to really be able to acknowledge each other. When I read Debarim, I just... I thought about um, I thought about everyone as well. That it's going to take everyone, and that um, we really have to be able to acknowledge uh, each other, acknowledge our brothers, acknowledge our sisters, um, acknowledge different points of view, um, all within the bounds of Torah. Um, otherwise, we're you know like we're really just playing games, and you know it's it's spiritual games, and it's just a bunch of talk. Um, you know, but, you know, are you recognizing your brother? Are you recognizing your sister? And do you recognize that it's going to take everyone um, to usher in Mashiach, to get closer to Mashiach, to make the world a better place and to really be a light? So, yeah, that's yeah, all. Good okay. Thank you. Um, Can we... I'm going to try to unmute Susie. Thank you. Um, I have a question about timing of this Parsha with Tisha B'Av coming up. Hmm. Because I'm not sure, but it's been my understanding that we lost the first temple because we weren't respectful of each other and did not listen to each other and treat each other kindly. Mm -hmm. Is that actually true? Is that timing work? Of why the why we have Tisha B'Av? No, why, why when Tisha B'Av is when it is on the 9th of Av and we're reading this Torah portion mm -hmm. about words and obviously we're all interpreting it as respecting each other. Right. I, first of all, I think that's actually like a beautiful piece of Torah you should write about why are those two things happening at the same you're like no thank you how about a beautiful commentary you could write Susie I want to read it and teach it in your name um I think there's a lot of different meaning we can make around like why are we learning this Parsha right before Tisha B'Av where um it marks destruction of temple where there's seen it's called Sinat Chinam like senseless hatred um and I think it's definitely there's a beautiful meaning there that and you're saying like time-wise, I don't know if it's that it's like lining up exactly, but I think there's meaning to be made there. Does that make sense? Less it like does. this happens, so that happens. Um, more effect, and yes, more right you. on. That's a gorgeous way to put that. And again, I want to invite us all. Thank you for that. There's a senseless hatred or words to each other, and the thing we as Americans do, I don't know, often avoid talking about. It's like, what are the feelings we have within us and what's the work we need to do and like grief we hold for us within Tisha B'Av or this Parsha? Mara, I'm going to let you DJ because I think I keep unmuting in the wrong way. But thank you, Susie. Never been called a DJ before. Thank you. And I, I just, um, I want to add that uh, Tisha B'Av is like really a container for grief. And this year has just been hard for everyone in so many different directions in the chat I shared um 
a communal Eicha reading, which is the traditional text that's read on Tishba Av. Um, and you are all invited to sort of share in, in that communal moment of grief. Um, and Ariel, we, we have three minutes left. I want to say thank you so much for your Torah, for the text that you've brought, for your enthusiasm. I think I'm echoing uh, echoing all of that. Um, I'm just seeing if there are any uh, any more questions. Um, yes, Ara in the chat, I will be sharing the recording and the sources and how you can stay in touch with Ariel. Um, please check your email. Um, and uh, at this moment, I'm going to ask Ariel, can you share an intention for us as we mm. go into a bracha, um, however you would like to to think through that? Um, what can we be holding this, this uh, Shabbat? Yeah. Um, I want to bless us with a heart of many rooms for ourselves and the courage to do the inner work, to see the parts of ourselves as we see as strange, ugly, difficult, and actually lean into love with them. So Shabbat Shalom. Amen. Thank you so much. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.